Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it another minute or so to give an opportunity for everyone to log in, and then we'll get started. I guess just another half a minute and then uh, we'll get going on this. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Asima Zahid, and I'm Director for Market Development uh, for Lloyd's Canada. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our virtual roadshow on product recall. The objective of today's presentation is to focus on the basics of product recall coverage. And I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Evan Pollock. Evan is a lead underwriter at Beasley and has been with Beasley since 2010. Evan brings a variety of experience and in-depth knowledge in claims and underwriting space. And today he will be sharing insights around Beasley's capacity and appetite on product recall in addition to why it is such an important coverage. So before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to leverage the Q&A tool located in the Zoom uh, to ask any questions you may have. Uh, we also have time set aside uh, for Q&A at the end of the call. Now, without further ado, I will pass it over to Evan. Evan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and kind words. And, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Hopefully uh, you can now see the screen that I'm sharing with you and our uh, presentation for product recall uh, is about to kick off. So uh, without further ado, here we go. So uh, once again, my name is Evan Pollock. Uh, I'm the lead underwriter for Beasley's uh, new product recall book of business. Um, I've been in the insurance industry, uh, as was said, for uh, the past 10 years with uh, focus uh, specifically on underwriting product recall for the last five years. Um, I, uh, I've uh, started this book of business along with our U.S. counterparts at Beasley um, over the last uh, year or so. We've gotten the, the portfolio for North America up and running, and we've uh, started underwriting in Canada as of uh, late last year. Uh, so we're, we're officially up and running. Um, so uh, very quickly, you know, product recall is, is a, a bit of a... a uh, still kind of in its infancy in Canada. Um, we've, uh, we haven't had uh, a, a large number of carriers and brokers uh, specializing in this space. So a lot of the uh, contact that I have with our broking partners or clients um, tends to be on more of a first time basis. Uh, it really surrounds a lot of education for the product itself. So, um, you know, this, this slide kind of encapsulates a little bit about what 
what product recall focuses on within the insurance industry and how um, our offering uh, can assist our clients in protecting their ultimately their financial um, uh, health and, and uh, avoiding any uh, stress that the costs of a recall might um, pose on their uh, viability to continue operations through the period of dealing with um, a recall or a withdrawal or a similar event. Um, so very quickly, a sort of breakdown of some of the major recall events over the last you know, 20 to 30 years that have really shaped how uh, product recall has um, come to light within the insurance industry. So dating back to the early 80s, the Tylenol recall that happened um, back then, the you know cost of it was about $100 million at the time adjusted for inflation. You're looking at uh, a quarter of a billion dollars uh, in today's money. Um, essentially what happened was there was a uh, disgruntled individual who was putting cyanide into Tylenol bottles. And at the time, uh, bottles weren't tamper evident and there really wasn't any mechanism in place for Tylenol or any, any company at the, you know, in the period to, um, to really be able to trace uh, batches and to identify you know, issues within their, their products that are out uh, to market. So it ultimately resulted in, a, in all the Tylenol pretty much out there at the time being recalled uh, for safety purposes. And of course, this kind of got um, various uh, industries thinking about not just their um, ability to trace their products, but also how um, insurance might uh, come into play. So fasting forward to sort of the mid 2000s, um, we had the Peanut Corp of America uh, incident where over a billion dollars worth of peanuts uh, were recalled. If anybody um, has a recollection of this, essentially the company had knowledge that Listeria was was contaminating some of their products um, and the executive team knew about it. Uh, however, they decided to ignore this fact and sent the product out to market anyway. Um, a couple of people uh, unfortunately died as a result. And uh, when the dust had settled after the recall occurred, the executives uh, that had knowledge and, and uh, chose to ignore it were actually sentenced to prison. Um, so this was kind of one of the, the big watershed claims that again is, is kind of leading up to, to present day. Um, you know, here you can see a list of a number of other recalls calls that have happened in the you know more recent past GM obviously they've had a, a number of recalls but uh, in 2014 had a large number of vehicles recalled um, uh, for various issues uh, resulting in 1.2 billion in repairs um, Takata we all remember the airbag uh, recall that happened that affected uh, you know millions of, of uh, vehicles across the planet um, and 12 different uh, OEM automakers had to uh, pull the impacted airbags out of their vehicles and replace them with new ones. Um, and, you know, I think the the one that's kind of uh, one of the larger ones that's in the most recent memory for us is, is the romaine lettuce scare where we had E. coli impacting uh, a large amount of uh, romaine coming out of what I uh, recall was the southwestern United States. Um, because of the spread of the products, uh, there was, you know, an issue in terms of traceability. Uh, government both in Canada and the US couldn't really find, at least in the early days, the farms where the impacted product was coming from. Um, and of course, this gave rise to both countries issuing kind of blanket government advisory saying not to consume the product at the time until they figured out, uh, you know, where the impacted product was from and, and where it could potentially be on the shelf. So again, massive losses on, on both sides of the border there. So uh, what is product recall insurance? Um, so uh, essentially it's, it's most important to note that this coverage is uh, not a casualty coverage. This is a first party uh, claims made policy that's specifically uh, in place to protect the financial wherewithal of our clients. So it's gonna cover the costs that are uh, incurred as a result of a recall or similar incident. Um, and it's meant to uh, directly protect our customer's bottom line. Um, it's typically a short tail coverage. So, you know, we have products that are being insured that are either perishable or uh, just in the sense of the claims life cycle. Um, it tends to be uh, discovered and uh, dealt with and paid out in a fairly um, uh, quick fashion. There isn't too much uh, long tail um, exposure for these types of losses. Um, in terms of the insurance aspect of, of things, the 
the, the claims tend to be rather severe. So where, again, the casualty line of business will deal a little bit more in the um, frequency aspect of things, and, and we do have some clients that tend to have some frequency issues. Um, severity is really more the major focus of these policies as a, as a recall can have a, a, a pretty large impact um, as a single event on the cost that a company is incurring, you know, hundreds of thousands into the millions and, and beyond, obviously, as we saw with that last slide. Um, and as I said, last but not least, it's primarily a balance sheet protection. Um, we are, you know, typically the first policy to respond in the suite of coverages that clients carry. Um, and uh, as the payments start rolling out, the idea is to make sure that the, the company can stay solvent as they deal with whatever issues they have. Evan, that's great. Uh, we, we just have a question, which I think kind of uh, touches on the, you know, the product and what it covers. Uh, so sure. I see somebody uh, posed a question with respect to the romaine lettuce issue you highlighted. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you cover this type of issue? Wasn't it a government advisory rather than a class one or class two recall? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I guess the first part is this is something that would be covered by the Beasley policy, and, and I will get into that. Um, but you're right, it, it wasn't uh, necessarily a class one or class two recall, because at the time of these government advisories, um, there was no evidence linking directly to the specific product that was making people sick, that specific batch or, you know, batches of lettuce. So um, when the government comes out and says, do not consume, um, and as we're going to sort of get into a little later, uh, a, a number of insurers and policies uh, that were meant to cover recall exposure were not responding because of how they were worded or what specifically they were meant to protect. So um, we will get into that uh, further, but great question. Um, so just to sort of cover things off uh, on, on this slide, um, so what does our policy do? So uh, essentially, if an insured has a, an incident, um, our policy is, again, designed to reimburse for the cost that they incur as a result um, of that covered incident in order to pull the product out of the stream of commerce, uh, to deal with any disposal, uh, and then to, of course, replace it um, once the issue has been uh, dealt with. Um, of course, we also have uh, many other coverages that are built into our policy form, including uh, extra expenses that the insureds are incurring uh, in order to continue their operations, business interruption, uh, third party financial loss, um, forensic accounting services, investigation costs, uh, the, the list goes on. And, and again, we're going to get a little deeper into that as well. But it's a it's a as you can see, it's an extremely comprehensive piece of coverage. Um, last but not least, I would like to point out that for Beasley Canada, any uh, uh, Canadian domiciled insureds that we are covering um, do have worldwide coverage under this form. Uh, so they're protected if they're producing or selling products outside of the country as well. Uh, so this next slide is kind of a good way to encapsulate how recall fits in within the sort of suite of insurance products available to clients who are in the, you know, manufacturing process and growing um, spaces. Uh, so as you can see, you know, the manufacturing E&O liability policies will butt up against the recall nicely, provide some cushion, um, but there of course are some dis uh, differences. So again, the recall is always the first party coverage. We're only looking at the financial loss resulting from a recall or withdrawal. We're not specifically interested in the bodily injury and property damage that the liability um, form is gonna be covering for. Uh, that's not to say that it's not interconnected because our recall form and and forms across the industry for recall will trigger um, with that element of bodily injury and property damage. But again, we're paying our customers financial loss where the, the third party liability is going to pick up the claims that are coming from the injured parties. Um, and last but not least, that manufacturing e &O policy. So this is kind of getting a little closer to what the recall policy looks like. However, the biggest difference that I always like to point out is coverage for breach of contract is typically held under the e &O form. Um, again, there's, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, you made uh, 9,000 units, I ordered 10,000. There's an issue there with how that, uh, that contract or that agreement was um, fulfilled. So we have an issue between that is kind of one of those examples. Um, the other thing that the manufacturing, you know, policy uh, um, 
does that we don't do is it makes third party payments. So our policy will always pay out on a first party basis to our named insured, who then is responsible for dispersing the funds to the, you know, clients that have suffered a loss or to their subsidiaries or to use it, you know, to, to mitigate their loss uh, as they see fit. So how does product recall look at Beasley? Um, and so what you're going to see with our setup is uh, a little bit similar to uh, Chubb, where I came from uh, in my previous life, where I was writing recall prior to Beasley. Um, we're specifically looking at three different policies within the scope of our recall uh, portfolio. They're specifically designed to cover the classes of products that we're looking at for any given account. So we have consumable products, which, as you can see, are topical and ingestible products specifically designed for human use and consumption. So this is anything you can put on you and in you, foods, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, makeups. Um, you know, it, it, it could be chemicals, things like that. Anything that uh, essentially is, um, is you know, one or, or sort of short-term use that's consumed by people. Um, a note is Beasley's appetite uh, is um, excluding pet food. Um, we are open to looking at some animal feed um, as well as like treats for pets, but large scale uh, specific mealtime pet food is, is not uh, within scope for us. Um, the second is consumer goods. So this is any finished non-food product. So the best way to look at this is if you walk into a Walmart or to a Costco, anything you're going to buy off the shelf that isn't a food or pharmaceutical style product um, is going to fall into the consumer goods category. And then last but not least, these component parts. So this is uh, these non-food uh, manufactured components that um, go into other items, whether they become another part, uh, part of another part, or they're um, a part of the finished product. As long as they disappear into another manufactured uh, good or product, that's the form that it's going to fall under. Um, it's also important to note that our policies will respond. Uh, in three ways um, in terms of how we can cover the products being offered by our clients. Uh, first and foremost, we can look at all the products within their catalog. Uh, secondly, we can look at a contract specific policy so we can specifically formulate our, uh, our policy to work for just a single contract that a client has with one of their customers and to cover only the products within the scope of that contract. Uh, and last but not least, we can do product specific policies as well, where we're covering just a single or maybe a group of products that a client feels has, you know, the most exposure or just that one thing that they want to have the coverage for. And we can exclude everything else. So what this does is it helps create a, a, the ability to not only um, have a, a more bespoke policy to let our clients pick and choose what they want to have covered, um, but it also helps control costs if they don't want to have a, a, a larger policy covering, you know, a large uh, number of items. And so continuing on this uh, with these three policies, each policy has its own trigger as well. Uh, they're going to look a little bit similar and they're kind of going to read in a similar fashion. But the reason why we have these, these policies separated with their own triggers is so that they read in a way that's most uh, specific to the industry that they're meant to cater towards. So consumable products, typically adulteration is going to be that terminology that you're hearing uh, for an incident rather than like a manufacturing or a product defect for a finished or component part product. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, tampering, adverse publicity, cyber incident, or a government advisory um, as being the sort of uh, 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 events, the blanket events that um, if there's an adulteration within this group of, of uh, categories will trigger the policy. Um, so going back to that romaine lettuce example, uh, a lot of companies um, that is insurance companies, when we are looking at the, the claims that were starting to come in for the lettuce, um, because there was a government advisory naming the products, um, a lot of the roaming lettuce producers or wholesalers are saying, hey, we've got this loss, it's an adverse publicity, the government came out and said um, that you shouldn't eat it. But how the adverse publicity endorsement tends to read in the industry is the product needs to be specifically named. So because their brand or their specific product wasn't named, it was just a blanket advisory, many companies were denying these claims. 
Um, so what Beasley's introduced uh, on our form is this element of government advisory, where if there is this blanket do not consume order from a government, um, our form will pick that up, even if the product is not specifically named and, and uh, would not fall under that adverse publicity coverage. Um, and as you can see, cyber, uh, we have affirmative coverage on all of our forms. So again, that's a nice little added element to our form that some of the others in the industry are not currently providing. On the consumer goods side, product defect is going to be our sort of trigger. Um, and uh, again, we see cybers included there. The other thing to note here is adverse publicity is included on the consumer goods form, where to my knowledge, I don't believe any other carriers are providing adverse for consumer goods at this time. So again, we're trying to add some things into our form that some of the others out there uh, are not currently doing. Um, and last but not least, component parts. So with this one, this is probably the, the broadest form that we've um, uh, that we've put out, and it's probably the broadest wording uh, for component part style coverage within the market. And the reason why I say that is we've, in this case, kind of done away with the idea of bodily injury and property damage or impaired property being the trigger where for us um, manufacturing defect is going to be sort of the trigger uh, within the definition. If any of these defects as it's defined in our policy um, leads to this idea of, uh, you know, uh, a product malfunctioning to the point of uh, causing a BIRPD, um, we're going to have a uh, likely a covered incident. So it's an extremely broad form. It's actually kind of pushing the boundaries of what we see on the manufacturer's ENO. It's not quite there, but it's pretty close. Um, and so it's, uh, in our opinion, it's a really great uh, piece of uh, piece of wording for our manufacturing clients to lean on if, um, uh, if of course, they have a recall incident. Going back to the other two, of course, with adulteration and product uh, defect, the idea of um, it tying into bodily injury or property damage uh, is still there. So adulteration um, causing uh, a bodily injury or property damage, or if it would cause a bodily injury or property damage uh, type event um, would trigger the policy. Same goes for the consumer goods. And the nice thing about this wording um, is the fact that this would cause BR, BI or PD um, pushes us away from the casualty form, makes us quicker to trigger. We don't actually need to have the injuries or the property damage occurring in order for the policy to trigger. Merely the idea that the product would um, cause these scenarios is enough for us to, to bring the, the coverage into force. I had a question here in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, how would a cyber incident be related to a recall? Yeah, very good question. And so we, we get this, uh, you know, um, pretty commonly from, from clients and brokers that we're dealing with and, and to, um, to sort of encapsulate an incident that that uh, you know could happen, especially with how interconnected companies are these days, the Internet of Things, and and how uh, let's say a production facility is going to be connected and managed through the internet. Um, theoretically, a, a you know a hacker or somebody could gain access to um, that facility's network and cause a production line to uh, speed up or slow down, or maybe to use more force when it's stamping something, or maybe a, a bottle filling line is is um, is caused to have the filling mechanism hit the top of the glass bottle harder than it should. Um, so you can have a lot of scenarios where you know somebody gains access to your network um, and and causes some sort of uh, 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 scenario where an incident could occur. To be perfectly honest, we haven't seen too much of this yet, but we do believe that this is sort of a, a trend that we might end up seeing with uh, with hackers getting more sophisticated in some of these denial of service attacks or um, phishing scams, people becoming more wise to them. Um, they're going to look for new ways to, to gain a, an upper hand on the people they're trying to essentially extort money from. Um, so happy to sort of, if there's ever any questions about this, we can we can dig deeper into that scenario or that line of questioning because uh, that, that could take a day and a half worth of discussion, I'm sure. Um, OK, so moving on, if there are no other questions, um, what is covered by our form? So essentially, uh, it breaks down into five major components. Um, again, we're doing 
slightly different things than some of the industry does where a lot of the other carriers out there are tending to um, give you some sort of package of coverages but then add on a lot by endorsement um, our policy comes all together in one uh, in one full package so you're not having to worry about what you're not getting uh, there's no potential for broker eno because you're going to get everything that we're offering um, under this policy and this wording um, so specifically the sections that we have uh, costs and expenses being probably the the major focus of recall uh, coverage since its inception so this is the cost for recall um, to bring the product out of the stream of commerce uh, to you know dispose of any product that you need to um, replacement cost is also included in this section so the cost to remake remanufacture refurbish and send the product back out into the stream of commerce once the issue has been rectified and then rehabilitation costs um, for the insured um, and so this is usually the sort of broadest area. These costs and expenses, specifically the recall costs, include both first and third party costs. So if there's third party recall costs that are being incurred by our insurance client, um, this part of the policy will respond to that as well. Uh, second is investigation costs. So this is all the costs that are incurred while investigating the root cause of the adulteration, defect, or, or tampering. Um, again, this is something that uh, is not necessarily out there in every form, um, and we build it in as part of the, uh, uh, the, the coverages that you're going to buy um, uh, from the full policy package. Uh, next is business loss. So this is... Um, equating to business interruption as well as extra expenses. So any BI that the, the client is suffering as a result of the recall or the covered incident, um, as well as the extra expenses that they're incurring as a company in order to maintain their sort of day-to-day -day operations. So an example of this would be if their facility gets shut down for listeria, and they have one production line and they've got you know, a month worth of downtime in order to get the uh, listeria remediated from the facility, the extra expense might be the cost that they're incurring to have a third party produce their product for them. Um, so again, really, really sort of a uh, good piece of coverage to have in there um, and can be a costly area for, for any, uh, any of our clients in the event of a recall. Um, Third party damages is the next element. So this is also known around the industry as like consequential damages. Um, you'll see, uh, so essentially this is the third party financial loss that's being suffered by the insurance clients. Um, so this can include fines, fees, and penalties that are imposed by the insurance clients themselves. Um, so if Costco has a restocking fee that they charge uh, a client, this would be picked up within the third party uh, damages section, as well as things like third party business interruption um, and other financial losses. So a good note here with this, and, and this is one of the largest elements of loss that we tend to see, um, is that, uh, you know, if Costco has an agreement in place, and this is fairly typical for a, a big box store where they say in the event of a recall, um, all of your SKUs will be pulled from our shelf until we know things are safe. And this could include SKUs that are for different products that are not impacted. Um, they'll still pull it and they tend to charge. I think uh, I'm pretty sure last time I checked a, a contract that we've seen, it's like $2,000 per SKU per store. So you can see where the cost can add up if you've got a large distribution chain across, you know, 100 or 1,000 Costco's within the country. Do we have a question? We do actually. Um, so we have a question on coverage uh, and it says, do you offer full sublimits on coverages to ensure broker won't have an ENO? Yeah, so we actually tend not to offer sublimits on pretty much anything. We'll give you up to the full policy limit. If the client does want to have a sublimit on something, we can always look at doing that. Um, but again, we we want to make sure that they have full access to the to the policy limit that they're putting in place. And again, this kind of helps avoid any uncomfortable conversations that a broker may have with a client. Okay, great. That was our only question on this. Perfect. Topic. Okay, and last but not least, the final element is forensic accounting services. So this is uh, essentially the cost that a client um, might incur as a result of 
uh, using you know a forensic accountant or other uh, third parties to help quantify their loss. Uh, now we offer that service through our claims uh, handling as well. But if a client wants to use this on their own, um, again, it's built into our policy and it's and it's there for their use. So really, if we're looking at kind of the largest three elements of coverage um, that are going to to result in major cost within a recall claim, um, the biggest ones are going to be costs and expenses, business loss, and third-party damages. Um, everything else in terms of the front and back end uh, consulting or accounting um, services is going to be a little more uh, on, on the smaller side, but still, of course, important for the, the scope of um, mitigation as well as uh, making sure the client is, is paid out properly for their loss. Um, it should also be noted that our policy does include uh, crisis consulting coverage. So essentially, this is uh, a, a, a stable of um, best in class uh, crisis consultants in both the food and manufacturing industries. Um, their specific focus is to help an insured work through the recall event. So essentially, if um, there's a loss that's ex that's potentially occurring, a, a client sees that there's some there's something that could be wrong with their product. We have a hotline directly to our consultants. They call the consultants and um, our, it's kind of like a cyber coach, I guess, is the best way to compare it, where our consultants will come in and, and basically work hand in hand with the insured in order to look at you know, what the issue is, um, how to begin to mitigate the problem, how to deal with the press, how to make the proper uh, um, uh, reports to the government, and then how to work through the actual uh, you know, recall itself and, and get to the other side where everything is done. Um, this is included uh, unlimited within the policy, so it's outside the policy limit, not subject to any retention, so it's, it's there as long as the client needs it. And um, if, uh, if it's discovered at some point after they've uh, consulted with our um, consultants um, that there is going to be no loss, um, the insured is not going to have to pay out of pocket for the, the initial expenses that, the, that were incurred um, from that service leading up to the point where the um, issue is, is um, seen to be resolved. And we also have another question on yeah. limits. What limits are available for product recall, including limits for business loss and third party damages? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to get to the sort of limits part of the discussion. But uh, again, with um, all of these uh, coverage, um, I guess you could say extensions or coverages that are built into the policy, they fall under the full policy limit. So whatever we end up writing. Um, is going to be available uh, as the the full aggregate, so there won't has you know there won't be any um, uh, question as to how much coverage you have for one section versus the other. Okay, and another question popped up uh, regarding uh, minimum premiums on your policies. Is there any set minimum premium? Yeah, there is. And, and again, so we're going to get to that very, very shortly. Okay. <laughs> so if you're there with me, we'll, we'll get there. Good questions. Everybody's chomping at the bit to hear it. So we'll, uh, uh, I'll be there very, very shortly. Um, okay, so it's uh, very quickly, I'll just run through a couple of the things that we also want to point out with our coverages in terms of exclusions. So our key exclusions are kind of on this left side of the slide here. They're going to be very similar or exactly the same to all the other exclusions that tend to be offered by carriers offering recall within North America. Um, you know, things like criminal dishonest act, banned substances. So if the insured is manufacturing or processing any client, uh, any products using a known banned substance will obviously lead to an exclusion of coverage. Fines, fees, and penalties. This is an important one to distinguish between what's um, seen with the third party fines that are imposed. So if Costco is imposing a fine on the client, um, that's gonna be picked up in the third party element of the policy. Whereas if the government imposes a fine or penalty, this is excluded under this exclusion. And again, it's a fairly uh, common exclusion across the industry. Um, natural deterioration. So we're looking at things like breakdown of a product or if it gets, um, you know, well past uh, uh, an expiry date um, and is, you know, deemed to be not fit for consumption, that kind of thing is going to fall outside the scope of the policy. Uh, again, pre-existing conditions. So we look back to like that peanut claim 
uh, where if it was a known issue and they, the company still decided to ship out the product and, and it causes uh, bodily injury or property damage, then obviously that's going to be excluded. Um, and then down at the bottom, the liability for BI or PD, again, this is falling more towards the casualty side of, uh, of things. So on the right, the exclusions that others or the rest of the market are doing. So we've actually tried to trim down the number of exclusions that we have in the policy. We felt fewer exclusions. Um, probably made more sense based on how coverage has evolved or maybe how claims and, and other, you know, issues that we've seen related to um, these things uh, sort of play out. So we've removed this idea of changing governmental regulation as being an exclusion. We realize that governments will give um, producers, you know, manufacturers, processors lead time in order to bring their products into a new regulation if things are changing um, and that typically the exclusion would say outside of that time frame then uh, we won't cover it you know for us we'll say look we we think that our clients are operating in good faith and they're trying to stay on top of these regulations again they that kind of also lends itself to things like banned substances where if uh, this new regulation bans a substance or bans a, an amount of a substance within a product. Um, if you're keeping up with those changes, um, you're not going to have an issue with the, the um, governmental regulation kicking in and you not being prepared for it. Um, you know, things like redesign and, and design expenses. So this is something a lot of the other product recall policies out there exclude. Um, we've actually now brought that into scope of coverage. We will cover the design and redesign expenses under our cost and expense portion of the policy. So that's something that a client can sort of sleep at night is saying, if I have to, you know, go back to the drawing board and redesign my product in order to get it safely back out to market, um, that's something our policy will pick up. Um, and things like GMO, hormone, and TSC. So again, this is like falling towards either the banned substances or to the carcinogen side of things. With GMO, we will absolutely cover um, a product that has GMOs in it. Um, we're, you know, we're not really looking at it from that long tail exposure again to go back to one of the, the earlier slides where we say, um, you know, we're looking at how this might cause cancer, it might be carcinogenic, there's, it's probably still too early to really 100% know for sure whether GMOs are, are causing cancer in humans or not. And even still, the, the um, discussion gets even more difficult in the sense of saying, you know, when or what amount of GMO then causes the cancer, right? It's kind of like the equation of cigarettes. How many cigarettes uh, does it take for somebody to get lung cancer? We don't really know. We just know it causes cancer. So it could be one, it could be a thousand, it could be 10,000. So it's just one of those discussions that it's a little bit more difficult to have. Um, and again, it's not really the scope of what our policy is meant to cover being a more short tail, um, adulteration, defect, you know, tampering focused uh, style coverage. Um, so now we'll, we'll get into the, the focus of our, of our uh, policy and, and the limits and pricing. So um, as you can see here, this sort of states our, our focus being within that small to middle market um, business range. Now we define small business as any accounts up to $25 million in revenue and middle market going up uh, into the sort of low hundreds of millions. Um, for us, we say this is our focus because we feel that this is a, an extremely underserved area of the recall market. There are countless insureds out there who are either not buying recall or have you know a product withdrawal expense limit attached to their CGL that really isn't doing them the justice that it needs to um, in the event of a loss. So we really think that there's uh, a large um, a potential for growth within this segment. Um, our approach also lends itself well to these smaller and middle market size accounts with the limits that we're willing to do. Um, so we can go as low as a $50,000 limit up to a $5 million limit on any single account. That's both on a primary or excess basis. So we can we can you know follow form if an insured is looking for an excess policy above their primary limit, or we're happy to be the primary layer that uh, if larger limits are required, um, you know they can go out and seek excess. 
We also have the ability to quota share, although we don't see that too much in Canada. It happens a little more often in the US. Um, but going back to our focus, it should be noted that we're more than happy to play within that larger or, you know, sort of major account size space as some of the other markets call it. Um, we will write uh, clients that do revenues over a billion dollars a year. So we're, we're extremely flexible. It's just more our focus is, is within that small to middle market space uh, currently. As you can see, we also have um, minimums for our retentions and pricing uh, indicated here. I think what's most interesting to note is um, for any account that we write under a million dollar limit, there is no minimum SIR and there is no minimum premium. So that's again why our focus kind of um, lends itself well to that small business space, especially, but also the middle market clients where if they're looking to just, you know, establish a recall policy for the first time, they've thought maybe in the past that they're too expensive, they're out of reach for us. We say, well, no, you can come and get a pretty affordable policy. If you're willing to have a limit under a million dollars, you know, we place policies routinely in the hundreds of dollars for, uh, from a pricing standpoint. So um, we can work with any client that comes our way. Um, what that also allows us to do is be very flexible on contract specific and product specific coverage as well. Again, letting us really sort of cut the cost of a policy if they're looking to have more specific coverage for whatever products they're offering. And so our considered classes. So I'll, I'll typically lead by saying it's easier for us to say what we like to not write versus what we will consider. This list is in no way exhaustive and it's kind of a little bit broad, but it will give you a bit of a sense of what we uh, are looking to write. Um, on the consumable side, of course, again, food of, of any kind is really within scope. We, we quite like bakery and confectionery companies, beverages or canned products, any preserved products are great. Um, frozen food is good. We're happy to write um, fresh produce. Uh, we, we look at meat routinely. Um, one thing to note on the meat side is if there's a slaughtering operation that's operated by uh, the client that we're considering, that will probably be a decline. Um, but on the flip side, if we're looking at, you know, again, processed meats of, of any kind, fresh or frozen, um, we'll look at that. Um, we have a vastly expanded appetite within the pharmaceuticals and nutraceutical space, especially compared to uh, where I used to be at Chubb and, and a lot of other companies out there. Um, we're more than happy to look at these. CBD, hemp, and cannabis. So it should be noted that uh, Beasley Canada is on the verge of opening up our product recall coverage specifically for cannabis. So that will be something that is within scope. We're just going through our final sort of checks and balances internally before we roll it out. So I'd say stay tuned on that, but we will be entering that space hopefully within uh, the next month or two. Um, on the So again, with consumable products, what we're going to sort of look to stay away from Pet food, again, is uh, is sort of uh, out of class for us. Um, some animal feed is within scope, but we're, we're taking a bit more of a cautious approach. And then things like uh, chemicals, additives, flavorings, um, those are going to be sort of out of scope for us, just in the sense of traceability is, is difficult. And once those items disappear into other products, it's very difficult to determine, you know, what causes uh, an issue, an adulteration or a problem uh, with a specific product. Um, and last but not least, bulk sort of commodity style risks are, are not really something that we're interested in writing. Um, you know, things like uh, large scale bulk flour or grains or, um, you know, anything of the like is going to be a little bit more difficult for us to write. Those uh, tend to be placed out of London directly because those companies are large and they require very, very large limits that we're just, uh, we're not capable of, of putting up, especially in our early days uh, of the portfolio here. Um, consumer goods. So again, pretty broad, but you know, any of these markets or any of these products are going to fall within class. I'd like to specifically point out, you know, medical devices and implants again on the healthcare side are within scope for us where a lot of other companies are, are tending to stay away from them. So uh, by all means, if you have any companies that are doing uh, those kinds of products, we're, we're happy to look at them. Um, and then on the component part side, so again, automotive and aviation, that tends to be uh, where the London market plays quite a bit and where a lot of the other uh, carriers within Canada are writing. Um, 
I don't know if there's necessarily a ton that falls outside of those classes all the time. There are, of course, a lot of companies that are doing it, but um, that tends to be the focus for them. We're happy to write that as well. Um, we, uh, we also will look at critical components. So again, not out of focus for us there. And then of course, any kind of manufactured metals, plastics, rubbers, stamping, injection, molding, that kind of thing. Um, and again, medical devices are within scope for us here. So we, uh, we're very comfortable within that space. And uh, last but not least, before we take some questions. So I like to end by saying who should buy this coverage. So really at the end of the day, anyone in the chain of commerce or production should consider, should be considered as a potential buyer here. Um, essentially, if you've got your name on a product or if you're making the product, it doesn't really matter. You have some exposure. Um, of course, some products are higher hazard than others, but just going through the list, I mean, if you're a manufacturer, a grower, a processor, a co-packer, a contract manufacturer, I mean, obviously these companies are going to have their hands on products. They're going out to either the end consumer or becoming uh, parts of other products that are going out into the stream of commerce. So of course there's some, there's some hazard there. Um, I have importer starred because within the scope of what the government looks at for companies is they basically view you as the manufacturer. If all you do is import, as soon as that product hits the soil in Canada in your warehouse and, and you have it in your possession, it becomes your product. So the government will look at you first in the event of a recall um, and not necessarily the company that supplied you with whatever product needs to be pulled um, uh, out of the market. Um, and again, you know, things like distributors, wholesalers, stock throughput, even transportation companies. Um, again, if they're touching the product, there is some exposure there specifically, um, you know, uh, strange things happen all the time. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's always good to, to see if there is um, some interest from your clients, if they're, you know, in these non-traditional maybe recall buyer spaces, because we have seen uh, incidents happen in the past. And finally, potential synergies. So, um, you know, this being Beasley and, and us being a very specialty focused carrier, um, there are a large number of areas uh, that we tend to write um, product recall policies in unison with um, on things like environmental and cyber. Obviously, they all go hand in hand. There's a lot of manufacturing and food processing and things like that um, that fall into both of those categories. Of course, with our large appetite on healthcare and pharmaceutical and nutraceutical uh, style risks, um, that healthcare and med risk book of business um, fits very well. So if there's any clients that sort of have these uh, these other policies in place, I think recall is probably a good place to, to consider looking next as we look to you know, round out their suite of coverages. Um, of course, if you have a manufacturer's E&O policy in place with, uh, with any of your clients, um, it probably does directly uh, lead to um, the discussion for having a recall policy in place as well. So you have that good third party and first party mix of coverages in the event of anything happening. Um, and then, you know, if, if uh, anybody's buying a CGL or property policy, which everybody is, again, if you're a manufacturer, if you're a processor, you know, you're going to have some exposure there. So just always kind of think in terms of how we might be able to cross over. And again, going back to a point that I made, um, if uh, with your CGL policy, you're placing a product withdrawal expense or a product recall expense limit. Typically, they're very, very small limits, 50 or 100K. It's a throw in from the, the insurer um, and they don't cover much. Basically, you're going to get just recall costs. Sometimes maybe you get a little defense cost throwing, thrown in there, but it's going to evaporate very quickly in the event, in the event of a claim. So um, it's always good uh, as an upsell to say, hey, we've got this withdrawal expense limit. How about we look at a standalone recall policy to make sure you've got enough coverage for that, uh, that exposure. So that uh, brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, happy to take any questions. And that's great. Thank you, Evan. We do have uh, quite a few questions for you, so I'll get started on it. Uh, do you provide risk management for consumers to identify the potential risk? Yeah, so as part of our crisis consulting services, we do offer some um, some limited uh, crisis management on the front end of our policy holders 
uh, potential for services as well. So essentially they can work with these consultants um, to have, you know, we have a, a library of white papers that are available. We're actually um, putting on a series of uh, podcasts on risk management every month um, that of course anybody can access, but of course our, our clients are um, directly encouraged to, to look into in terms of the sort of hot topic items of the day or uh, with specific focus on certain industries. We're also actually in the in the process of looking into developing some further um, uh, services that um, our clients will have access to, including like an app that gives them direct access to um, some additional risk management uh, uh, focused products. Okay, that's great. Uh, and I do have a question, um, and I'm not sure what it means, but it says if you write access, are you then follow for? Uh, yes. So we essentially, if we're if we're um, going to be the excess layer, uh, we will typically follow form whoever is sitting primary. Um, so we'll take on that uh, that wording if, of course, that primary limit gets eroded. Um, and then there's a question about uh, appetite. Uh, are breweries and distilleries within your risk appetite? We absolutely love them, both personally and from an insurance standpoint. <laughs> There, um, there, there, there's quite a bit of exposure there. We see, I mean, again, not the highest hazard product, but we do see quite a bit of uh, claim activity within that space. So if you have anybody, breweries, wineries, distilleries, um, even just if they're doing bottling of non-alcoholic stuff, we, we love those kinds of accounts. And I believe that's all our questions. Um, and uh, there, the, quite a few people wanted to get a copy of this presentation. I hope uh, it is okay for us to share that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. So that brings us to the end of our virtual show today. Thank you, Evan, for the excellent and insightful presentation. And it is very clear from the conversation that product recall is a very important coverage. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us again, and have a great week. Thanks, everybody.